Last Pie Productions presents the New Way Podcast with Ben and Matt. The New Way Podcast contains adult content that may not be suitable for fans of Neil Patrick Harris. Listener discretion is advised. I've chosen for my book report a work of contemporary fiction, the latest in the ongoing series of Bazooka Joe and His Gang. Oh, I'm just hanging out with me Clara Forda, sitting in front of me mother's mirror and putting on their woman's cosmetics and stuff like that. Teach me about this. What is it? A new way? Apparently, I'm introducing today's podcast. Welcome to the new way with Ben and Matt. I am Matt. I'm Ben. What's going on? Not much, Ben. How's it going on with you? <laughs> this is the worst opening we've had yet today. I, uh, it's amazing. When I said what's going on, I wasn't referring to you. I was referring to the audience. Yeah, but then you left this long eight, pause for our, like that one person to talk back it, to their radio. It's to, like, our, to our 18 he, listeners. He, he to, was talking to me. Yeah, uh, that was, it was to our 18 listeners, to the people. It was to your mom. I was saying hi to your mom, Matt. <laughs> Uh, well, this is good because my mom and I will apparently be listening to these podcasts on CD on the most uncomfortable car ride through Texas that's ever <laughs> taken place. Because your mom doesn't can't figure out how to make this. My, my mom was like, "Yeah, this is a little difficult to listen to on my iPhone. Can you make it a little more accessible and burn it to a CD?" And I said, "Absolutely." That's uh, well. First, I told her I was like, "Oh no, that's way too hard." She goes, "Oh." Okay, and I was like, no, no, I can. It's um, it, forget it. I can't explain it. You might as well just. It, it was like my grandmother. Did you know my grandmother actually like left the room on the Christmas that she got a computer? Like we gave my grandparents a computer and they just left. Like she just got up. She was like, no, it's not in my household. This is not going in my household. This is like in 1999. Witchcraft. Witchcraft. Yeah, exactly. It was. It was <laughs> I imagine your mother being like, this. No, it's not working through here. We have to use the CD, the old fashioned CD. If she was really old fashioned, she'd ask for it on eight track. Do you imagine my mother often, Ben? I do. Son of a bitch. Very often. All right. Um, anyways, uh, thanks so much for listening. Again, of course, you can find us lastpintprod.com. And uh, you can have all the click-throughs for the social media outlets there uh, on Facebook.com slash Last Pint. And then uh, Twitter at Last Pint Prod. Uh, hey, you got it right. I got it well right. Well done. Time. Well done. Anyways, today uh, we have a, a guest in the uh, studio slash house slash uh, apartment. My apartment in Boynton Beach uh, in the hood. And uh, this is actually going to be a lot of fun because uh, originally our guest today... Uh, I got to know through uh, a work associate of mine, and he, he's now actually doing some work with the organization that I work with, which is a lot of fun. And especially after we had our initial conversation together, I was like, I really have to ask him to come onto the podcast just because of his uh, very, very extensive and, and really impressive body of work that he has done as an actor uh, or performer. And many different uh, lights. But so anyway, yeah. it's uh, Braden Danner. You can say hi. Hey, thanks for that. Nice Welcome, Braden. And we also thank Braden for being here today because Rob Schneider canceled at the last <laughs> minute, and we actually we're going to just ask you the same questions that we okay. had prepared for Rob. I love. Um, so uh, you know, what was it like working on Deuce Bigelow? Seriously, the sequel. A lot of Europe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Europe from different uh, perspectives, shall we say? <laughs> yeah. Well, anyways, uh, to give a little background on Braden, uh, Braden is a very very accomplished like I said performer and uh, from a very young age and I, that was uh, really a, at a very young age established himself and we'll get into this in a little bit as far as his background but established himself as a, a very well respected actor at an extremely at an age where I, I think at the age where you were doing what you were doing I was like my the most important thing to me was like I was probably watching the blob and I was trying to figure out what an erection meant I was still <laughs> masturbating to Tom Hanks <laughs> <laughs> and he comes all back around oh, it comes no all, <laughs> it comes all back around to the first podcast oh, but uh, but Braden uh, has, has a very extensive career um, especially in his younger years on Broadway and uh, and acting in many different uh, performances so we're going to sort of get into you know the stuff that he and originally started working on in a second, um, but the first thing I almost wanted to ask you 
is obviously at this point, like it's really cool that you're working with us now. Um, and so I know that you were LA based for a really long time, right? Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. but I want first before we go back into your career, you were telling me about how you went around the world on this trip. Yeah. And you were talking that because you blew my mind when you were like, yeah, you can get one of those like around the world trip tickets for like twenty one, however yeah. much money you spent, like twenty one hundred bucks. Mm-hmm. Uh, explain what was the impetus of that trip? Like, what actually led to that trip happening? And like, where did you go? Like, what what was what was going on there? Well, I love this show. You know, I love how we can just go in any direction. And uh, yeah, that oh, was just you wait. <laughs> <laughs> I used to love that too. <laughs> oh no! Well, yeah, that trip came right after film school. I uh, went to film school at USC, and it was pretty intense, especially toward the end, and I found myself needing a break after uh, university. And one of my friends, actually a couple of my friends, were talking about doing an around-the-world trip. And the first time I had heard about that was from a friend who was actually doing an around-the-world trip. I met him in California when he was traveling from the UK, and he was on his way migrating around the globe, and And I had never heard of this. I was like, what? You can, rather than just getting a round trip, you can just get a series of one-way tickets and make your way back to your point of origin. And he, yeah, started to explain it to me and told me. And it seemed like this amazing (laughs) voyage that was almost unattainable. But the more he explained it and explained that he was staying with friends as he traveled and he kind of picked destinations where he knew that he would have some friends that he could connect with. It seemed kind of like the kind of thing that was doable. Like, how many locations yeah. do you go to? Like, well, how does this and work? didn't you work? Do you like worked along the way too? Didn't I did. You? Too. I did. Yeah, you don't have to, but I did. And, Prostituted uh, your way across the world. <laughs> <laughs> My dream. Uh, I did a lot of uh, a lot of filmmaking. I did some commercial type stuff. I did some documentary type stuff. Very, very. Uh, I don't like low key. It. Yeah, I don't want to make it sound like more than it was. It was for friends. <laughs> For the most part, but they paid me. If you've they... seen Prometheus, that was one of the projects he <laughs> yeah, worked on exactly. uh, in New Zealand. Yes. Yeah. No, but um, yeah, you can. You can. I mean, the price of the ticket is basically determined by how many places you want to go and where you want to go. Um, and it the price is also different depending on like if you go with just one airline, well, then you're probably going to pay an arm and a leg, you know. But if you go with some of these travel agencies that actually specialize in around-the-world trips, then you can get it to really, I mean, bargain basement type prices, and you can get them to compete with one another for your business, which is that's what I... Awesome. awesome. Yeah, that's what I did. So um, so what was the coolest place that you went on this around-the-world trip? Well, the when I went originally it was after film school, it was in 2004, and... There were probably three or four places that I would think about a lot after my trip. I, I spent almost a year traveling around the world. And your, your around-the-world trip is good for up to a year. It's good for up to 12 months. Nice. And I spent nine months traveling. And um, But after I got back, there was one place that I just couldn't get out of my mind. And that was the Swiss Alps, the Bernese Overland part of the Swiss Alps, which is this really dramatic area of these amazing um, peaks that are just... There's so many peaks in one area, and and then there are these little green valleys. It's actually the Lauterbrunnen Valley, which is where I was living this last time that I went. Because I did it again. I thought about it so much that this last summer I thought, well, I need to go back there because I'm always thinking about this place. I'm always talking about these places. And I I also went paragliding when I was there in 2004, which is for listeners that don't know what paragliding is because it's kind of popular in some areas but not in others. But it's kind of like... um, you have the same type of, a similar type of glider wing uh, shoot that you would have if you were to go skydiving, but it's it's a bigger, so it allows you to glide longer. A lot longer. Yeah, right. it's kind of like a cross between a hang glider and a uh, and a parachute that you'd use if you were in skydiving. But um, so I did that in 2004. I remember I got to Switzerland, looked up in the air, and heard these people like, Woo-hoo! I was like, "What the heck is you know what is going in heavy on?" Swiss I mean, accents. Yeah, right. <laughs> or. Uh, or from all over the world, and so I was like, what is that? And they're like, oh, it's paragliding, and it's like, oh, that's it, I'm doing that. And so that was another thing I kept thinking about, and to make a long story short, this last uh, year when I kind of needed a break from L.A., I thought, well, if I ever need a break from L.A., I know where I'm going to go. 
and uh, that's where I went. <laughs> I feel like I need a break from L.A. when I go out there for three days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ben had a rough time the last time we were in L.A. <laughs> we're not, so, we're not going to talk about uh, this. Does it involve the last pint, uh, many pints? Of, oh, oh, there was oh, we the last there. pint happened at 9 a.m., and uh, the rest of the day followed that it, last it, pint. It was, it was St. Patrick's Day. Oh gosh! It was, it was a it was a slaughter. It was it was pretty bad. Yeah. Slaughter is exactly the right word. St. Patty's Day in L.A. is a pretty big affair too. I mean, there's a lot of people out. I think we visited what, nine different bars. <laughs> I hadn't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we when we wound up at the Russian bar at the end of the night. Oh, uh, boy, that boy. was oh that was that was a night. Um, <laughs> a night to remember. All right, so you've traveled our, the our world. Nights completely forget. Yeah. All right, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you've traveled the world. Where? Where were the prettiest girls? Like, what country had the hottest girls? Oh, man, that is a fantastic... I, I am... That's a fantastic thing for me to just think about, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take a brief pause while Brayden goes into the other room and no, no, catalogs the hottest women in the room. room. I am staying right here. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's even worse. <laughs> oh, well, I didn't... You guys... <laughs> sorry, sorry. Well, I, 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 at risk of making uh, uh, Brayden very uncomfortable, obviously. <laughs> we're complete jokes. We're here. all wearing full clothing right now. <laughs> for now. Just for the uh, listening... Oh, we are? Oh, shit. <laughs> well, I feel awkward now. Forget, for, forget about the whole making Brayden uncomfortable thing. Yeah. We've already broached. We see, we've already gotten so far off track. It's ridiculous. Oh, I love it. I love this. This is going to be so much fun. Brayden, I'm enjoying this. Scotch. I'm, I know. I'm enjoying this scotch. Oh, actually, speaking me. of which, uh, uh, this week, Last Pint's uh, production of The New Way is brought to you by Lagavulin Scotch and Bell's Two Hearted Ale. Yes, absolutely. And I'm really enjoying this Lagavulin Scotch. It's good. So what what woman would make you... Wait, what country's <laughs> women would make you say, I don't need any more of this Lagavulin. I've got oh, God. all of the uh, all of the, the desire. I, I don't think you're going to hurt anybody's feelings here. No, no, I'm not a... You know <laughs> like what? a French I mean, woman's just going to run into the room like, you bastard, you yeah. told me it was the hottest one you've had? I think um, the straight answer is the most beautiful woman I saw in my whole trip was in Norway. And the, the Scandinavian... Uh. The Scandinavian <laughs> no, women are kind of famous for being so beautiful but I am going to say this and this is not to sound politically correct because I don't really get into PC stuff but I was one of the things that I did learn from my trip is that there are beautiful women everywhere it's <laughs> an important thing to learn yeah there really are and and of all different shades and sizes and types you know but um, I tend to gravitate toward the European women I lived in Budapest for a while and um, uh, Hungary Eastern Europe, you know, um, Czechoslovakia, I'm not Czechoslovakia, Czech, Czech Republic. Republic, yeah, the, yeah, scotch, is, the scotch is, uh, <laughs> is kicking in, uh, <laughs> Prague, you know, I, I was in Prague for a little bit, that whole part of the world, um, Scandinavia, Germany, even France, you know, um, actually when we landed, the day we landed, I was totally jet lagging, but I remember we were getting our tickets because some of us were... I had an around the world ticket, but some of my friends that I met up with first in Paris had uh, Eurail tickets, nice. and they were doing that kind of the classic American run through Europe in two weeks kind of thing. Right, and <laughs> and so, um, but we were waiting in line, and I was just my breath was taken away by this French girl, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be a great trip. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the, nice. the most beautiful is Norway, with possibly France yeah, or, uh, or some other. France where, is, a, is a good runner up, yeah. Where were the wildest girls? What country had the just, like, off-the-hook girls? Oh, gosh. Off we were turning hook. this into, like, Howard Stern. Dude. <laughs> uh, I'll be honest. I'm just asking for my own benefit. We can yeah. cut this out of it's the true. podcast. Exactly. I like, no I'm, I'm, I'm married, and, and, uh, and Matt, of course, is the guy who's like, no, I'm going to these places. <laughs> no, I, I, I've been yeah. taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> he has his laptop up. He's booking his round-trip tickets right now. I don't know how to spell Budapest, but it's on my list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I I love these kind of questions because, like, when I talk about going around the world, I don't usually get asked these questions. So, um, I think probably the the places that you want to go, Matt, are <laughs> yes, the, are the places where people let their hair down. You know what I mean? Like, it's not so much that it's a it's a country that's known for letting its hair down, but it's like a location where people go to let their hair down. So, kind of Amsterdam. Like, you could think Amsterdam. I was thinking of, of like Bangkok, for example. Oh, wow! Well, Bangkok. 
<laughs> like the sound of this. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> oh, that, that, that's, that's, that's sufficient. That's enough. I'm pretty <laughs> sure I've got enough on my list now here. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I've got to go book a trip. You guys continue on. And, uh, yeah, Thailand's absolutely. amazing. Greece was amazing. Um, yeah. So I've always wanted to go to Greece. Uh, Greco-Roman wrestling. <laughs> I'm the only one that thought of I that. Just want to go to the Greek Greece. Isles. Sorry, okay. Well, anyways, um, to, to <laughs> kind of bring it back, uh, uh, now that we're done, you know, lusting over uh, <laughs> over Braden's experiences in other countries. Well, we're not entirely done because I do have another question. Not, not with this, that, but it's, that's fine. It's coming up. We'll we'll get to it. But anyways, a little cliffhanger. Uh, oh yeah. Um, just so we can kind of establish uh, Braden's. How how much he was in the acting scene, especially on Broadway in the mid to late eighties. Uh, Braden originated a very very famous role in one of the most, if not arguably the most famous, uh, long running musical of all time, which is Les Mis. And you originated the role of Gavroche. That's right. Yeah. So. How did that come about? Like, I mean, explain and what... For, and for those of you out there that maybe don't know the name, if you saw the movie recently, it's the little kid who, <laughs> I, spoiler alert, yeah. gets shot yeah. right in front of Russell Crowe. Not in every production is it Russell Crowe, but it's, uh, but he <laughs> no, was the most... Ever since it first started, it was always <laughs> Russell Crowe. <laughs> Russell Crowe just always loved watching that kid get shot. Yeah. That's why I became an actor. <laughs> um, no, but I, I, I'm interested in knowing how, because you're, I guess, would you consider that the kickstarter of your career, or would you consider some other earlier stuff? I mean, because you, you were doing some TV stuff, or I guess, were you doing other... Yeah, yeah, no, I had done a lot of things before that, but that certainly is one of the biggest highlights of my career. I think it's, you know, of all of the productions I've ever been uh, privileged to be involved with, Les Mis is by far my, uh, my favorite, and... A really memorable experience, but the way I got got connected and and ended up getting cast as Gavroche was um, I had done I was Oliver and Oliver on Broadway right. with Patty Lapone and it who was, writes about you in her book <laughs> that's right yeah. yeah right because I was not originally cast as Oliver which is a great showbiz story that we can some get some poor really other little kid we well, gotta no, get, into that. get into that yeah. story right now I want to know you want to you want to yeah. hear about that? that so story. yeah what Patty kind of touches on is kind of a it's not that uncommon in show business for these kinds of things to happen but they're really heartbreaking um kinds of things that go on sometimes but uh, a young boy named Cameron Johan who was a good friend of mine uh because we had both done another Broadway musical the first musical I did was called Nine which they've recently not too long right. ago um remade for film with Antonio Banderas, I think was Daniel Day Lewis. Well, Daniel Day Lewis, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, Antonio did the revival on Broadway. That's right. But um, Daniel Day Lewis and, and some others. And um, so I was in that uh, when it was originally on Broadway. And uh, the little boy who played young Guido was uh, named Cameron Johan and still is, and named <laughs> Cameron Johan. And he was a good friend of mine. And um, and you were how old? Well, when I did nine, I was seven. Seven. So, okay. Yeah. Not when I was seven, I did nine. Um, <laughs> oh boy! Yeah, and um, and so and and before that, there's some fun stories we can talk about too, involving Ginger Rogers, which you you film oh, guys, yeah. you film guys, I think would probably be interesting. Interesting, yeah. But, Ginger Rogers, you may not know, uh, from Gilligan's Island. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and Ginger, it's too. A yeah. It's a joke. Really? And just gave me that look like you got like, your notes wrong. Wah, it's not wah, from that. Wah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, um, yeah, so getting back to what the original question was about uh, Patty LuPone's memoirs. So she wrote about how um, this little, this young man, Cameron Johan, was originally cast, and we were in rehearsals, and probably a good week or two into the rehearsals that he not only signed the contracts, but he was rehearsing as Oliver. And they had, I don't know, it felt like we were there for a while, maybe because I was eight at this point. Um, maybe it had only been a week, or, but I, I think it was at least a week. I think it was probably more than that because I was good buddies with the other kids in the, in the uh, I was cast as an orphan and uh, originally. And so uh, they, the, the director and the producer came in from London after the rehearsals had already gotten started by their assistant director and they, they looked at Cameron Johan and they said, that's not Oliver. And then they brought in a few different kids and I was one of them and they said, 
And that's Oliver, you know. And that was Cameron McIntosh. That was Cameron McIntosh, yeah. yeah. And Peter Coe, who directed the original film version of Oliver. Oh, and, wow. and also the original uh, Broadway version as well, I believe. Um, so, yeah, Peter Coe uh, and Cameron McIntosh made that decision. And so, uh, which was heartbreaking because, you know, even though... I, it, it's pretty funny, though, because when I was cast as one of the orphans, I, even though I was only eight, I remember having a conversation with my agent saying, I don't want to do it, because if I'm not going to be Oliver, I don't want to do it, <laughs> which oh, sounds man. so pretentious, you know? It's like the, oh, my eight-year-old, I, <laughs> I deserve this role. It wasn't so this much that I, it wasn't, to be fair, it wasn't so much that I was pretentious or that I, I, I didn't... I, I was only making the joke, no, no, I know that a, you're not. No, no, it's a good joke. But it was actually... It was, no, Ben, you're very, very funny. It was, it was actually because I didn't want to be... Uh, when I did Nine, I wasn't the main kid. And I didn't want to be backstage as much as I was backstage in the other show that I was. I wanted to be doing it, you know? I, want, I loved what I did, and I wanted to be doing it. And I thought, if I'm not going to be... I don't want to be, you know, backstage having to deal with all that again. And so... But my agent's like, no, you know what? You really should... You should do this. This is a great musical. You're going to love it. So I went to the rehearsals, and then, you know, a week or two later, then I was Oliver, and then the reason why Patty writes about it is because she was like, when they fired Oliver, she's like, oh no, I might be next. So, And so you did that right prior to Les Mis. That was a couple of years, about four years before, well, three, about three years. Three years before. before. Yeah. So, so that but was... when they brought Les Mis from London, the uh, creators of Les Mis... Uh, you know Cameron McIntosh, who also revived Oliver, was was producing Les Mis as well, and so he was um, a champion for me and uh, brought me in to the casting director, you know, and said, "Take a look," and and then and then they brought me in to the directors, and uh, then I was cast as Gavroche at, at that point. But and like McIntosh was like at that point, he was like the go-to producer for like Broadway hits like he was a huge name he was but he was still before this is before Phantom the only big hit that he had had that I that I can say for sure is Cats he was involved with Cats and so he was um, an up and coming Um, Oliver was a great production but it hadn't done so well in terms of they they closed it after a month and that was mainly because of one bad review, as far as I can tell from the research that I've done. But, um, you know, back then, Frank Rich could open or close a show for you. Yeah. You know, it's funny, actually, and here's this thing. I mean, you were opening as a lead on, in a major thing, and I actually kind of want to get into the, some of the question sort of stuff, because this is sure. a good time to broach this type of question, which is a well-phrased question by Matt. Did Patty what? Lapone come on to you no. during <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> it's, it's not that. It's, that's not that question? Not we're not that there question. yet? Okay, uh, were you That's able? But were you able bad, to grasp? I could sell some stories. Were, were, you, were you able to grasp like like the enormity uh, and the the actual at that age? Did you know what was going on? Did, wow. Were you able to to comprehend all of it and appreciate it to a point now where you you can look back and say, uh, you know, you you weren't didn't feel like you were squandering that opportunity yeah. or at least the feeling of doing that. That's a great question. Um, I think yes and no has to be the answer. Like, for example, when Michael Jackson comes to see you perform in Oliver, which happened, and this was right after Thriller came out, so he was the biggest thing on the planet. You know that you're doing something that's amazing, but at the same time, until you live life and you kind of have more of a breadth of experience, you can't contextualize it as much. I mean... I think I definitely was able to savor it, and in some ways I still savor, and I'm so thankful for all those moments. Um, but I think I view it through different lenses now than I did, obviously, when I was, you know, 7, 8, 11. Yeah, I mean, obviously that's going to yeah. come with, with some time and experience. Well, and, and then you moved on, you and then you were also doing Starlight Express. That's right. Which yeah. I was curious, like because I, I know that's more of like a, it's like a voiceover, more of a voiceover role, correct? Yeah, it's totally voiced... Um, uh, Were you like there at the theater to do the role I each did, night? I did go to the theater, not every night, but what I would do is once in a while I would come and make a, a curtain call appearance. Oh, nice. Yeah, because the voice of control, for those that aren't familiar with Starlight Express, 
is basically the narrator of the musical. And Starlight Express is this uh, fun... It's a lot bigger in the UK than it than it ever has been here, but it, it made some waves in Las Vegas and also on Broadway. But basically, all of the performers are on roller skates except for my character, who is um, basically supposed to be this little boy who's playing with his train set. And so all of the performers on stage are his trains that he's playing with. And so right. the narrator would kind of set up these races for and, and heats for his races uh, for yeah. his trains to compete against one another and uh, that was the role that I played and so every once in a while I would uh, go over to um, the Gershwin which is around the corner from the Broadway theater where I was simultaneously doing Les Mis and so I would leave the Broadway and go over to the Gershwin and, and take a curtain call uh, that's why Brayden is like one of the only young performers to be in two hit musicals on Broadway <laughs> at the same time, which yeah. I guess is like physically impossible if you're actually like uh, on that. But yeah, I mean that's I mean but that's got to be such a huge thing. Like I mean, everyone kind of at some point in their life sort of lives through their past or or looks back on these things like your things. And for us, it's I was like, oh, I played geothermal energy in my second grade play, and it was amazing. And I still look back on that fondly. And you're like, oh yeah, I was on Broadway in two hit shows at the same time, and it was handpicked. Uh, you know, it was pretty awesome. So that's incredible, man. It's it's a real. It's something I'm so uh, very grateful for, and um, something I, I think about fondly and and um, yeah i'm just very very grateful and it was a rare opportunity at the time i mean um sometimes it can be tough you know i think about like uh, uncle rico from napoleon Dynamite <laughs> or something like that who's you know stuck in his heyday of of playing uh, great high school football or something but you know it can be tough for actors who are young performers to kind of grow up and figure out life and and you know i think about um is it Haley joel osmond yeah yeah i think about him sometimes and i wonder you know what it's like for him because he's had some roles as an adult but he had some huge opportunities as yeah a kid, you know when every director is banging down your door right exactly things. right Which, right and and lest uh all of you out there think that that brayden's like uh rise to fame was only on broadway you also went on and did a lot of TV work yeah. as well. So I like to live, man. Yeah, yeah. And and the Mickey Mouse Club, uh, mm -hmm. who has a couple of famous well, people that came which, from it. Which uh, I mean, I'm interested in. So, what was the the real spurring thing that that led you to television more? I mean, because I mean, yeah. you were doing all, all Broadway almost mm -hmm. exclusively, and then you went into doing a lot more stuff, I guess, for TV, and then doing Mickey Mouse Club. I'm sure Mickey Mouse Club was a, its own job for. Uh, for that first season run. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was, well, once we were under contract with Disney, they basically owned us, which was one of the reasons why... <laughs> they, it's one it of the reasons why I, I didn't want to stick around. For, I was under a six-year contract, and I after the first season, I thought, oh, I can't take uh, six more years of this. So um, That's insane to sign a, a child to exactly. a six-year contract. Like, that's... that's yeah. Criminal. I mean, that's ridiculous. Yeah, which is why they couldn't hold me to it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice. But, um, but yeah, you know, the way that television came about was actually... Pre actually, I actually got involved with television before I got involved with theater, but uh, which isn't too uncommon. A lot of times you'll be doing them sim simultaneously, whether it's a commercial or um, something of that nature. And so I started doing print work when I was six, and, um, you know, some people ask, well, you know, did your parents push you or how did that come about? And um, the way it kind of came about for me was both of my parents were performers. And so it kind of felt very natural for me to get involved because I would, when I, from the time I was two, I was going to my mom's rehearsals or my or dad. She was a stand up, right? She was a stand up comedian. That's crazy. Yeah. Awesome. And she also was involved with like improvisational and theater groups, and so I can remember some of my earliest memories are from you know going to to rehearsals with her. Or my dad was also a, a singer and he did like barbershop quartet stuff. So oh, nice! I started doing barbershop quartet with him when I was like four, and you know in retrospect, um, I wonder had I maybe not been around it as much if you know if I would have chosen to do that, but. You know, it's hard to say because you're so young and, and it's all you know. 
but what I can say is I remember because I was immersed in this this fun and exciting world that I was rather than being dragged into it by my parents I was basically dragging them into it because I you know we would go to dinner theater for fun it was just what they loved sure. to do you know yeah. so we'd go to dinner theater and see this you know production of uh Showboat, for example. <laughs> I remember Showboat was one of the first uh, musicals I remember seeing. And I just loved it, and I would be humming the humming the songs and melodies afterward and stuff. And um, and my, I would ask my mom and dad, can I do this? You know, I really want to do this. And they said, no, you're not old enough. And I was probably four or five at the time, you know. Yeah. No, you're not, not old enough yet. And so finally, by the time I was six, I was able to convince them to let me, uh, you know, start getting involved. Right. So I started actually doing TV commercials and uh, print work. And then I started doing um, some, you know, local, like regional uh, productions, um, which is where I worked with Ginger Rogers. That was in Indiana uh, in a show called Miss Moffat. And then, but what often happens in actors' careers is as they, you know, do a little bit, then they'll do something a little bit bigger and they'll get a little more recognition and get an opportunity to do something a little bit bigger. And that's kind of how my career snowballed um, so quickly when I was young. And so One Life to Live came, came along after I'd already done As the World Turns, which I did that. Um, right after Oliver, so I was eight, and I did As the World Turns uh, for a while, and then, um, and that's like a pretty like soap operas is a pretty grueling shooting process as well. As you're shooting every day, like yeah. uh, a whole thing going on. It's that's almost right. like live TV. That's exactly right. <clears throat> I mean, I didn't realize that until I got into it. What. You know, the joke was always among actors, you know, you don't want to be a soap actor because the acting was so, you know, poor, you know. But yeah. but when you're in a soap opera, you realize why oftentimes that's the case. is because this is a really challenging medium. I mean, you're getting new scripts sometimes five days a week and changes happen on each script, you know. So you'll get a script and you'll get a script the night before sometimes or a couple weeks before depending on, you know, how how far out they are with the show. And but often I remember getting scripts maybe a few days before up to the night before because of revisions and then you go in the morning to do blocking. We would go in at, you know, sometimes 5 or 6 in the morning. And the way each soap opera, you know, had its own format and way that they liked to do it. But uh, the way that, like, One Life to Live, for example, would work is we'd go in early in the morning, we'd block it, and we'd go through our lines, and sometimes revisions would happen at that point. Yeah. And so then, by the end of the morning, you'd have some revisions that you needed to learn for the afternoon, and you go back in the afternoon, and you do dress rehearsal, and then sometimes you'd get a few more changes. And so, by the time you get to the actual, you know, recording of it, um, it's really challenging, especially sometimes you'd have, I remember having page-long, like, monologues that were in some of these scenes, and that's challenging <clears throat> no matter what. So I have a great respect for uh, any, any actor that's in a medium that has that kind of turnover. Um, right. Yeah, it's it's really... It was like, like James Franco went back and did, uh, I, I forget what, Young Soap Opera. Like, or yeah, something General like Hospital that. or something? Like, and it was one of those where I remember my, I was such an asshole. My, my friend is like, oh, you know, James Franco is doing one of these soap operas. And I'm like, no, you're wrong. And she's like, no, because it was like right around when he was up for an Oscar for 127 hours. Right. And I'm like, it's you've got the name wrong. It's probably Dave Franco. Poor Dave <laughs> Franco. I was like, that I can see. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, like, and then sure enough, it's like, oh, James Franco begins yeah. his like 80 episode arc on such a such soap opera. And he did a soap opera for like six months. I didn't even know that. Crazy. Oh, that's, yeah. That's insane. I became friends with uh, one of the uh, execs at. Franco's production company, and we talked about how he's one of the ways that I respect James Franco is that he's pretty fearless. Like he, he just does what he wants to do, you know. And I mean, sometimes that pans out well for him, like when he gets nominated, and then sometimes <laughs> he does it, Your Highness, <laughs> or he or he hosts the Oscars and it doesn't go well. I don't know that he was so poor, but um, he wasn't received as well. At so. least, at least, it may, I mean, he's able to make fun of himself now as well. So yeah. like, I don't know if you saw the between or the between two <laughs> ferns uh, thing where he's like, 
He's like, if you were a really good actor, you would host the Oscars. He was like, I did host the Oscars. <laughs> I was like, no, that, that wasn't what you could do. I wouldn't call that hosting <laughs> that wasn't the Oscars. Oscars. <laughs> I think you should, if you were real actor, you'd actually go back and really host the Oscars. But, um, hey, give James Franco a second shot, everybody. Let's get him back in there. <laughs> this has been turned into the Save James Franco Fund. Uh, like, If you can spare just one laugh a day, James Franco will come back and host the Oscars yeah. again. Uh, I don't think we're going to have any takers on that one. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, anyways, well, here's kind of a funny so obviously we've gone over you know most of your early career and uh, and then you of course did Mickey Mouse Club now you you shared this story with me uh, and briefly you can kind of recap it if you want to about how because when we first talked you said oh I went to USC I went to the University of Spoiled Children uh, film school. <laughs> I don't school. think I said that. No, I, I said, you know, I call, that's what we all used to call it. Yeah, yeah, that's the famous... Uh, uh, he, he went to USC film school while I was at FSU film school. Another great film um, school. Yeah. And, and we we started the same with year. With Matt Beans? Yeah, with, with Beans. With Beans. With Demo. Demo. With, you know, yeah, he, we actually know some people. And at, Christina, was Christina... Well, did you know Christina? Um, yes, Christina Morris yes. Uh, and Dan Morris. Yes. Um, well, I knew Christina afterwards okay. from the last time I, or one of the previous times I visited LA. Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah, it, it's just so funny how insular that community actually is once you actually start talking sure, in production yeah. circles mm-hmm. because we have mutual friends and we know these mutual people. Uh-huh. Uh, anyways, I think it was an interesting story that you told me because you were this very accomplished, you know, actor as a young person, and you had an experience that. Or a conversation, I suppose. And who, who was it with? That was with uh, uh, director. Um, oh, David Onsberg. Dave, David Onsberg, who did Hoosiers. Oh yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and we hinted at this. At an we did. Oh, did podcast. you? We did. Nice. Because, well, as soon as you said yes that you would do it, oh, cool. I, we actually said that we counted all of we our did, chickens before they hatched. <laughs> we, we did uh, sports. Uh, sp- uh, oh sports yeah, movies. that's great. And, yeah. and we mentioned it in that, but. Uh, I know that you were having a conversation with him, and that sort of led you eventually, I mean, much further down the road, to maybe doing some stuff behind the camera. Oh, yeah. No, he was instrumental in my my whole path. I had, uh, when I was doing Les Mis, Trevor Nunn and John Caird were the directors, and they are just such amazing um, craftsmen. When they were in rehearsals with us, I was really inspired at that point uh, just by watching them work to see how they were able to mold and shape not only the overall arc of how they wanted Les Mis to be, but very specific little nuances of performance and be able to evoke performances from their cast members really without being heavy-handed and without the cast members sometimes even feeling like they were being directed. I mean, that's one of the things that was that many of the cast members have talked about. That's a mark of a good director, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think so, too. And I I was really impressed with many of the directors with whom I had the privilege of working, but probably Trevor Nunn and John Caird were the first time where... And and Cameron McIntosh, too, from seeing him work in Oliver and then again in, in... in Les Mis, by watching these guys work, I thought, man, it'd be fun, because as an actor, you have so many creative opportunities, but it's kind of limited in terms of the whole scope of the piece, you know, but as a director, and as a writer, and as a producer, you have a lot more opportunity for creative elements and and creativity, you know, and so I remember starting, I had already been you know, starting to think of stories that I wanted to maybe direct and stuff when I was really little. And so when I was, I was cast in a movie with Whoopi Goldberg called Clara's Heart, and um, David Onspaugh was slated to direct it. And um, we were maybe a couple weeks before shooting, and I went to uh, have lunch with the director because we had started becoming friends, and he was... David Onspa, I mean, I have such respect for him as a director. I had already seen Hoosiers when I was cast in um, Clara's Heart, and, and I was so impressed, not only with um, Gene Hackman's performance, but just the whole story, which David Onspa tells so well. And I think it's one of the greatest sports movies of all time. It's up there. It, yeah, it, yeah, it yeah. made my top five list. Yeah, I mean, it's really well done. 
and it holds its own. It, it's not, it, you know, time hasn't diminished a lot. I think it was, it. was it my number two? Yeah, it was my number two. Yeah. Bomb. The only one I had above it was Breaking Away, which Breaking Away is my favorite sports movie of all time, which nice. isn't even really a sports movie. It's more of a coming of age story, but, mm. you know. I digress, anyway. Yeah, but Ben no, had to pick something, you know, that no one else would pick what were your on t- his top five. Yeah, list. what were your guys' top five? I want to hear this. <clears throat> um, I had Miracle in there, which I really, really liked. Yeah, yeah. that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I had, uh, well, I remember I saved We both had two of the same on our list, right? Uh, Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams and Bull Durham. Bull Durham. Did you have had that? And then I had Jerry Maguire. I had The Sandlot. Oh, The Sandlot. And... Yeah. Makes, makes the cut. I, hell yeah, it's yeah, it makes good. the cut. I forget what my fifth was, but uh, something. That's a good one to pull in there because that's kind of. Oh no, yours was uh, North Dallas Forty. Oh, North, North Dallas which I made Forty. Fun of because I had so never seen it. Yeah. yeah, we're turning that on again. I'm telling you, man. Great, <laughs> great grizzled Nick Nolte performance. Can't beat that. Um, um, but well, anyway, no, so I'm, getting back to the the yeah. announce boss story, just to finish that thought. Um, you know, because I was inspired by. Um, by Trevor and, and John and many other directors with whom I work, uh, when I went to lunch with David Ospa, one of my first questions was, how do you become a movie director? Because, you know, I'd love to do that, but movies were, at this point, I hadn't done a feature film, and I was just so excited about doing it, and that was my, my first question. One of my first questions was, like, how do you become a... And how old were you? I was 12. I was actually doing Les Mis at the time, and, um, and so, and then I was going to take a break to do Clara's heart. And, and so I remember his, his answer. So I, like it was yesterday. He was like, well, you know, if you want to become a film director, you really want to go to, to one of two schools, really. I mean, he said there are three, three that you can go to, but um, you want to go to USC, which is actually where I found out later he went, um, UCLA. He said those are really the two best to go to because they're in Hollywood, basically, and they're in the industry. But he said NYU is also really good. And and then of course FSU is in the No, he school. never said he didn't say he didn't say FSU. Not at that time. Honestly, yeah. FSU Film School was founded in 1989. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, FSU Film School didn't become something until like 98, 99. Right, but not I just until Benjamin Wilson went no, there. No, it, it wasn't until Reb Braddock. Reb Braddock who who graduated from the FSU Film School who, who became Quentin Tarantino's pet and did Curdled for like 3 million basically back in in 90, 98. And then because Curdle didn't do amazingly well, but still made money, he basically just took all of the profits from that and then sat on them and came back and was the undergraduate film uh, director of film at FSU Film. So, that's yeah, all, but the, now it has a fantastic program. Oh, I mean, it's, it yeah. had. A, I mean, it was ranked. And now it's ranked a lot lower than it was when I went there. <laughs> because when I went there, in the whenever they do those rankings right, or whatever, right, for the yeah. film schools, it was ranked number four in the country. Yeah, now it's like number eighteen. And Beth loves the, to point out the fact that you know who's what's right above FSU film, Emerson. Emerson, <laughs> <laughs> where she went in downtown Boston. That's She's funny. like, ha ha, Emerson right above FSU. Yeah, that's funny. I went to Blockbuster Video School, film school. Yes. Uh, film school you know what? And, uh, I've heard good things about that school. That's not a bad school, actually. <laughs> I, I actually worked on this. <laughs> Sorry, that was a. Uh, oh bomb. my God, Almighty! <laughs> that ben. was the last really? point right there. Yeah, that was. <laughs> That's Ben Bull in a China Shop impersonation right there. Yeah, I just I just kicked over an empty look at, ball. Look at what it looks like on screen. Look at your mess. Look <laughs> that, at your mess. That, that's what it looks like every about, time you laugh. They're talking uh, about the, the, uh, wave, the, wave, uh. the wave forms. <laughs> oh, but, but, but anyways, so yeah, you had this... Uh, it was really cool that you were telling me that you had this conversation that kind of led to you eventually deciding to do... It totally did. It totally did. I mean, I was 12 years old at the time, and I never forgot it. And I was, uh, from that point on... That was my dream, was to go to USC or UCLA. Um, I also visited NYU, and I ended up finally looking at schools, and I went. I visited all three and decided to go to USC, which is, uh, I had such a fantastic experience there. Uh, George Lucas came and taught one of my classes, and Steven Spielberg is on the board of trustees, and it's so connected to Hollywood, and, um, and some of my classes, I mean, I use them all the time in life and in art, and... Um, yeah, I mean, for me now, working more uh, behind the camera and as a director and as a producer, I, I use every day things that I that I learned there. And I remember, you know, when David Onspa, you know, made that recommendation, it was like that was a that was a real key moment for me. And kind of 
a funny twist on that whole story, uh, because if you look up Clara's Heart, you'll notice that it was not me that did that with uh, Whoopi Goldberg. It was actually a, a young boy who did his first um, movie. It was his first job ever, and his name's Neil Patrick Harris. <laughs> and so, but but the this time the shoe from Oliver. Was, he obviously was, had no career after that. Yeah. So it's really bizarre. I swear this is going to sound really bizarre, and I apologize, but I was like, you kind of remind me of Neil Patrick Harris. Like, not this was before <laughs> oh you God. mentioned this little twist of fate that I did not look up in my notes. So, well, you uh, know, that's very strange. You know what's really now that you said that, uh, this is a really funny story too that you guys might be interested in. You might not. Our listeners might be interested in, but. People tend to love <laughs> the this. three of you out there. <laughs> People tend to love this story because um, when I was cast in Claire's Heart, like I said, it was a couple weeks out from shooting uh, when I had lunch with David Onspa. Then probably about a week later, it was really like only a week before shooting, I'd already signed the contracts and everything, um, I got a call from David Onspa. And... Um, and he talked with my mom first, and I could tell she was really upset, and I didn't know that it was him on the phone, but then my mom called me into the room, and she said, yeah, you know, David Onspaugh's on the phone, and I was all excited, because he was now my new hero, yeah. you know, new best friend. Yeah, and, um, and I could tell by the tone of his voice, you know, he's almost in tears on the phone, and, uh, and he said, uh, you know, this, sometimes this happens in show business, and of course, I had already been through all of her. Yeah. So I already knew what was coming, you know, and he said, um, he said, sometimes this happens and, you know, this is really, uh, a bad situation, but, uh, I am not using his exact words. This is like 20 some years ago, but basically the gist of it was, he was like, yeah, you know, they've decided the studio executives have decided that they want to go with another little boy. And I told them that it was going to be either you Whoopi and me directing it or that they'd have to find another director and they've decided to find another director Jesus and so he, he walked he uh, to his credit I mean I gained even more respect for him according to the story that came down to me anyway directly from him and from my agent and from all sources that I know of uh, he you know that was what happened and basically there were some people that in the in Warner Brothers that decided that they wanted Neil Patrick Harris and um, I don't know actually what went down but the the ironic thing about it and when you said that I remind you of Neil Patrick Harris the ironic thing about it was that the reason that came to me was that they wanted uh, a different look <laughs> um, <laughs> interesting and the, the ironic thing about this was that this would haunt me for years to come because when I would go to high school uh, now I had stepped away from the business after the Mickey Mouse Club. I took a break to just kind of quote unquote be a normal kid, and I went to high school. And um, kids would call me Doogie Hauser because this was the era when Doogie was yeah. big, and uh, and it would kill me. Yeah, I was about to say that must have pissed you off. Oh, it would kill me because I was like, the whole reason that came down to me, what that, <laughs> the it's actually even funnier than that. The reason that I was told was that I, I didn't look Jewish enough and that they were looking for something a little more Jewish because in the script, the family's Jewish. Well, the funny thing is, I actually have a Jewish heritage. I'm Jewish by ethnicity, whereas I don't think Neil Patrick Harris is. But anyway, you get these... I've never thought of like Neil, Neil Patrick Harris as like <laughs> Jewish, one of our yeah. greatest Jewish treasures. Yeah, right. He's so. a, yeah, exactly. A Jewish treasure. That's funny. So, the, But it doesn't. the story doesn't end there. So... Then, I uh, years later, I'm in L.A., and now I've decided, okay, I've worked behind the camera on a, a few different TV shows, but I'd really like to get back into acting again. So I'm doing the typical actor route of working at a restaurant. And it's one of these really high-end, fine dining places. In fact, if you've ever watched Top Chef, uh, Michael Voltaggio, uh, sure. the, the Voltaggio brothers, um, was our we chef. Talked, we talked about We that talked about this a little yeah. bit. Uh, did I tell you this part of the story, though? I'm not sure. Uh, I don't, I don't it, think I did. It may, have, may, Maybe. may or may not be. Maybe. But anyway, so it's one of these restaurants, uh, for people that aren't familiar, these really high-end Michelin-rated restaurants uh, have uh, wait staff that are 
that are grueled and, and, and grilled every uh, day. You know, like you have to line up, come into line up, and you're 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 told who the VIP guests are going to be. You're in your your uniform. Don't and mess up this table. Yeah, everything is inspected. You know, <laughs> and uh, it's really like a high pressure situation, but. Um, but it pays off. Like our, you know, our our wait staff won the James Beard Award for those foodies that are out there. It's kind of like the Oscars of wait waiting. But anyway, one day the chef comes in, Michael Voltaggio, and he's like, he's practically like giddy. And this guy, you couldn't make giddy. He was a real dictator in the kitchen, yelling at everybody all the time. <laughs> and if you've watched Top Chef, you know what I'm talking about. But he was a nice guy too. But this day he um, he was just almost over the moon. And he's talking about this very important VIP person that's coming in and how we have to be on our best behavior and, you know, this is a big deal. And, you know, we had celebrities coming into the restaurant quite a bit because we're in L.A. And, you know, but this guy he was so excited about. And who is he talking about? Neil Patrick Harris. Neil Patrick Harris. <laughs> <laughs> and here what I was this. What, when was this? This was... 2010. Okay, so how much your mother had been on, so he had reached out. Oh, yeah. Well, he was like a right. darling at that point. He was like, huge. Uh, he was yeah. huge. And so then I'm just like, <laughs> I'm mad at God at this point. I'm like, this is, this is, not, this is not a funny joke, Not God. again. You know, this, is, this, this joke has gone on too long. And so I'm in the changing room talking with the only other wait staff member who's an actor because this is not the type of restaurants that actors work at. This is career waiters. Yeah, these yeah, are like yeah. culinary students that are waiters at these right. restaurants. These are like... They some, want to make their way into the, yeah. You know, these are like, you know, real, the real deal. There's only one other guy who's in the industry and he was a great waiter as well. But uh, we were talking and I was like, Josh, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can actually come in and serve Neil Patrick Harris. It's like I have to draw I have to draw the line somewhere. You know, this has been my whole life. And so and he's like, dude, I've got a story for you. <laughs> and and if this is going on too long, just tell me. No, no, no. I'm I'm wrapped uh, right this, now. I've I've got to know. This story is so funny. He's like, all right, dude. I said, well, have you Josh, have you ever been in a situation where you signed the contract. Like, I still get paid. I still get residual checks to this day from Clara's Heart because I signed the contract. I get, I get paid for it for that movie as if I had done it. I'm going to buy a copy of Clara's Heart tonight on and Amazon. You're, and, and, and you're get going you. to yes. profit, Brim. I'm, I'm getting you money tonight. I appreciate that. If you watch it, I'll watch it with you because I've never seen it. <laughs> 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 so if you watch it, give me a call. I'll come watch it. I've, re- I've refused. But anyway, <laughs> but I'm, I'm becoming, I'm healing from this. this is a, even, even this interview is a cathartic. A, is a cathartic process, right? So, so anyway, I'm talking, I'm in the locker room, I'm talking to Josh, and I'm like, Josh, I can't do this. Have you ever signed the contract to do a project? And then they come in and they replace you with somebody else, and that person ends up going on to have a bigger career than you. you this know? guy was like, I was in Oliver once. And uh, I got recast. <laughs> <on. laughs> no, but he said, you know what? That he said, I haven't had that happen. But he said the closest thing that I've had was uh, recently they were bringing Rent to L.A. And he said I was up for the part of Matt. I think Matt is one of the main characters. Mark. Mark. Mark? Is it? No. Is yeah, it? the yes. one that's Mark, uh, and, Mark and Roger. Mark, Mark. Is, Mark is the okay. the film dude. The okay, film the Ben. Right, okay, the so <laughs> the the main character with the M for the first uh, letter, that's who he was up for, Mark. And um, and so he's like, it's, it was down to me and one other guy. And I went on a Friday for the final audition for the whole pr- uh, creative team, so the director, the producers, everybody. And he said, it's one of, those, one of those auditions where you just know. You leave the room, you know. They're asking you on the way out the door about your availability, telling you to make sure your calendar's clear, and that they're calling your agent. You just know you got the part. Yeah. He said, before I even got home, my phone's blowing up because my agent's calling me saying, you basically got it, but we have to get the fine you know, details worked out. They're going to confirm on Monday. So he's at home over the weekend, and Sunday rolls around, and in L.A. there's this section of the L.A. Times that comes out called The Calendar, where it's all about like industry and film-related you know, events and stuff that are going mm-hmm. on. So he opens up the calendar, and he's reading about rent. And it says the part of Mark will be played, played by... Anthony Rapp? No. Neil oh, Patrick, Patrick <laughs> fucking Harris! <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was coming. I was just waiting. I wanted you to say it. 
<laughs> Neil Patrick Harris. And so I'm like, oh man, at that point I'm just dying in the locker room. And I'm like, all right, well, I guess if you're coming in, you know, then I'll come in too. And then the week, it, it was a week later that Neil Patrick Harris came in with his partner to celebrate their anniversary. And because that's how many days ahead the chef was talking about yeah. this, which never happened, you know. But a week later, Neil Patrick finally rolls in, and uh, my buddy Josh bails. Such, <laughs> such just me, and I'm pouring water for Neil Patrick Harris and his boyfriend, and I'm just like, I can't believe this is my life, dude. We need uh, to make, we need to write a sitcom, the three of us, <laughs> that are people that Neil Patrick Harris has left in his wake, yeah, I, and they're all like forced to live together it'll, and it'll, make their it'll careers. It'll be like being John Malkovich. <laughs> it's all going to be, be Neil everyone Patrick has Harris. been like, it, and it's not anything that Neil Patrick Harris has done. It's just going to be one of these things where he is like, he has no idea. He's like, derailed he's everybody's right, career. In his wake, and he's like. I'm I'm a really nice guy. Yeah. Well, so, anyways, I, I don't want to go on for too long, and we're all, almost going to start wrapping things up. Where are we at right now? Uh, 54 minutes. Yeah, okay. Uh, the, yeah, it's time to kind of wrap up. I, I have was, to ask my one question. Okay, ask your question, because right. that's more important than mine. You, According to Wikipedia, oh. you worked with one of my biggest crushes of the 90s. Okay. Jenna Van Oy in oh, The Sound of Music. That's right. That, yeah. For those of you out there that are in my age group or Ben's age group or our age group, Jenna Van Oy played six on Blossom yeah. and was clearly the star of the show. The show <laughs> should have been called Six because she was amazing. So you, you actually worked with her? Yeah, long before she ever did Blossom. We did a couple of uh, projects. And boy, did she blossom. <laughs> oh. Continue. We did a couple of projects together. Um... We were in, I think we did a Christmas Carol and Sound of Music together. I know for sure we did Sound of Music. Um, I think she was uh, the littlest girl in Sound of Music, and I was Kurt, the youngest boy. And um, this was in New York, and so this was long before she uh, was famous. But, yeah, you know, it's funny because as I think back on my career a lot of the kids that I either was friends with or went to school with because I went to professional children's school um or did shows with went on to become you know huge stars um so it's it's kind of a funny it's kind of a funny business and a funny funny life in a way I was gonna say I mean my my major question was gonna be what are the things what are the major and I'm thinking of an encapsulated the smaller sort of answer here what is the major pitfall or that you've seen? Because I'm assuming you've probably seen a lot of people succeed. You've also seen a lot of people fail, ultimately, yeah. mm-hmm. who have come out of that whole... I mean, you were talking about Haley Joel Osment, who I think sort of qualifies in that because he saw this all of the success when he was very much younger, and he was so high-profile yeah. that it ended up being a detriment to him. <clears throat> but I was kind of interested in seeing what what has your experience been seeing some of those kids and uh, and you're uh, while also you know encapsulating your own experience what what do you think the, the major pitfall is of of being such a huge star at that age yeah that's a great question i i think you know it's really tough because one of my friends has put it like you know when you peak when you're 6 you know it's pretty rough <laughs> you right. know what i mean and um, cuz he kind of jokes about himself that that his peak of his good looks were when he was six years old but i identify with that i I was a great looking kid yeah right i don't know what the hell happened (laughs) well don't put that's why all the pictures on last pine are me when i was six oh yeah Uh, a picture of you you in the toga (laughs) it also gives us some really interesting fan traffic from older men you were you were (laughs) were holding a beer at six Uh, i I loved it it was root beer ben continue continue (laughs) Yeah, I think it can be really tough for... I think the the road for a, a young actor can be a tough one. I mean, uh, most of the people that I grew up with um, have experienced the challenge of it. I mean, it's tough either way. If you're successful, it can be tough. If you're not successful, it can be tough. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people ask me about some of the, uh, the superstars that came from the Mickey Mouse Club, for example, uh, with whom I, I didn't work with with them. Uh, I was in the first season, and a lot of the major major megastars came uh, after I left. 
But, you know, I think it's been tough for Brittany, you know, from what I can tell. And I think it's been tough even for, you know, some of the other big names. Um, because what do you do? I mean, you're a professional child at a very young age. If you leave the business like I did, well, then that has all kinds of uh, challenges of its own, you know, that I didn't, uh, I didn't really know how challenging it was going to be until after I left. But then if you stay in the business, it's, it, it has a whole other bag of challenges um, because then you don't really get to experience, quote-unquote, a normal childhood and you never know what you missed out on. You know what yeah. I mean? And I mean, how do you know, like, at that, I mean, and you thinking can't. at that age, you can't, right? I, that this is what I want to do for that. I mean, look, I not <laughs> I apologize to bring him up again, but I mean, look at somebody like Neil Patrick Harris who really did go through that same thing. Neil Patrick Harris has this stardom that hits, you know, with Doogie Howser mainly. Not he's not known for Clara's heart. I can, I can tell you <laughs> yeah, that much. Right, right. Um, but yeah, he has this thing, and then he drops off. Like right. you know, it, he, he's he's you know your your friend that you were working with that that got ousted from Rent by mm-hmm. Neil Patrick Harris. That was the only thing I ever saw his name pop up, and that's because I I watched stuff about musicals. So, I mean, he, I know he was in... Matt doesn't even Ca- like Rent. I'm yeah, yeah I, I hate Rent, but I knew he was in Rent, and he did Cabaret. Like, he did a lot of theater work, yeah. but it was like, this was someone that was a huge star, right? and then just kind of, they did sort of drop off for a while while he did his own thing. Like, that, I think there definitely has to be that figuring out what you want, yeah. and maybe in your kind of right, I think, with someone like Britney Spears, that... Who knows what she actually wanted by the time she had what was, you know, there that she had to do. I think the common pitfall is you don't really, you're not given an opportunity to know who you are. Yeah, you can't make any choices. As a performer or as a person, because when you're, when your schedule is dictated by your work at such a young age, I mean, I'm not going to make any sort of like Michael Jackson sort of comparison, but you do have that, that thing where your work becomes your life and then you get to the point where they're relatively synonymous with one another and at your first bit of freedom, like you get to the point where you're such an established personality, or you have this, uh, and you have this couple months off, or something along those lines, then things can go downhill very quickly. If you're, yeah, you know. yeah, I think the way that I would put it isn't so much that you don't necessarily have the opportunity to know who you are, but it's more of kind of more of what you were saying about how because you're you're so um, immersed in this world. That because I, I feel like myself if I, my my sense of identity was very very strong and, and has always been very strong. Yeah, I wasn't trying to put words in your mouth. No, no, I, just I didn't think from, you were. Yeah. When you yeah. also come from a family that of is, and that makes a huge right. difference. Yeah. You have like a family that is they're 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 accomplished artists, but they're not necessarily people that have been chasing fame. You know, right, like right. Lindsay Lohan's parents are chasing fame. Right. That's what they want. They're not there to like just have their child doing what their child is interested in. I think that the parent side's got to play into it. You seem to have a pretty well-adjusted family life. My mom was great, and she was, I mean, kind of famously, my the, from the friends with whom I worked, for instance, in Les Mis, they'd always comment, your mom is not a stage mom. And my mom was very careful... Um, to like, I was in Little League, I played, I had a kind of a normal kid life and I had my professional life and for elementary school, it was, it was really easy for me to have, uh, my regular friends and my showbiz friends, you know, but yeah. what, when it became difficult was when I did the Mickey Mouse Club because it was this all consuming, you know, we would get up at six in the morning and we wouldn't get home sometimes until nine at night on the first season. And I was like, this is not what I signed up for. You know, this is not the life that I knew or enjoyed. And so, um, I I think, um, the way that I would put it, uh, has been that it's, it's, it, it can be really difficult to, to find your way. Um, when your whole identity is in this really exciting, successful, um, of a world-class experience kind of environment you know like you're just exposed to these amazing experiences at a young age and if you're not able to continue down that that road that can be devastating on the other hand if you do continue down that road like i kind of alluded to before that can kind of have its own bag of tricks to deal with as well and so and you're doing something like everyone else is fantasizing about like every other kid is just like oh my god you get to make movies or you get to do right. tv and as a child you can't disassociate maybe the kid doesn't like it like i think that's a problem that, like there's some kids that get into it and then 
they don't like it and yeah. they don't love it and but their friends are like you're nuts like it, it's the equivalent of like when you're dating someone and you see the actuality of it and you're like it's not working and all your friends are like are you nuts dude you're never gonna do better than her <laughs> she is so hot <laughs> I, I know who you're talking about I think that's a fantastic ana- I think that's a fantastic analogy actually yeah. because I kind of I kind of had that experience when I was doing the Mickey Mouse Club of like I I kind of felt like because this was the only experience I had of really like, and I don't mean for this to come across the wrong way, but my experience from a really young age was just success after success after success. And so I thought I'm going to be able to leave show business, go have my normal high school Mm -hmm. life and I can get back into show business and become an instant success anytime I want to, because I am who I am. You know what I mean? But my experience was quite the opposite. And that was really, uh, difficult to come to terms with that hey you know not not that the story is over by any means and i and i still um i wouldn't be surprised if i'm acting again someday but i think you know there was definitely as a you know kind of as an aside i've seen interviews with michael jackson for example and uh it's amazing sometimes when i hear him give his answers how much i can relate because Mm -hmm. Part of the reason why he had Neverland and, and was always doing things like a kid was because he felt like he didn't get that when he was a kid. Right. And he, as hard as my mom tried to, to protect that, I still at times feel like, man, there's still things that I that I kind of miss, you know, um, that maybe I miss maybe a little bit more than your average person would because they, they did that. But... Um, but now I get to paraglide and do fun things. Well, like yeah, that. awesome. Oh, yeah, dude. And you that's travel great, around the world. And, and, and that's a great bookend. So uh, before we end up everything, is there? Do you did you think of any strange questions? That I did. I don't know how strange it is, but one oh, of the things fuck. that... Do we have time? Oh, yeah. Oh, so no, we do. I, just, we'll I dread question time. So, all right, go ahead. <laughs> this is really... This is, oh, really, like, is going to be an innocuous, uh, very tame, tame question. But one of the things that I love about the film medium is it's... It's kind of a classic medium for one-liners, you know? And so, if you guys had some, you know, top five one-liners from movies... Just do your ooh, top one. I would be interested well, to hear yeah, those. Yeah, I'm thinking what my top one is. Uh, but while you're thinking about that, I'm going to add a little caveat, a caveat okay. to the whole thing. I already, I already have my top two. So. You got your top oh, two. Oh, well, look at you. You're just always so ahead <laughs> of the am. game. I am. on top of it. What's, the, what's your the other, the other caveat is because this is a... Um, this is a program where we talk about beer as well. Maybe we can tie in um, beer or alcohol into these questions. Somewhere. Yes, give it a parameter because I don't want him to already have his answer. I actually, well, mine, one of mine takes place outside of a bar. So that's, does that count? Uh, I think that's that's close enough for you me. Stop that! No. I think that, that's close enough for oh, me. Oh, here's one one line that for some reason it's it's written by Christopher McQuarrie, who wrote The Usual Suspects and most recently directed like Jack Reacher. But there's a line at the very opening scene of The Way of the Gun where Benicia del Toro and Ryan Phillippe are outside uh, playing cards on the front of a car. The alarm starts going off, and Sarah Silverman starts sounding off being like get your ass off the car or whatever and then this you know she keeps screaming at him and ryan Phillippe turns around and goes shut that cunt's mouth or i'll come over there and fuck start her head uh-huh. and for some reason that line always i it just made me laugh and especially the reaction of sarah silverman and the people in the thing. i was waiting just, for the beer or scotch involved no but uh, no, wow. no, it's outside everyone's waiting to get inside of a, a club but my other one was is of uh of course we came we saw we kicked their ass which is it's a, it's Ghostbusters great is my favorite movie oh right so, yeah sure it's tough tying it to the booze the first thing that yeah. popped in my head since we're drinking good scotch was it's suntory time oh and the entire <laughs> for, for scene relaxing, from, for from relaxing time for relaxing time close, close your face <laughs> close your face close your face <laughs> close your face of course from Lost in Translation I, I couldn't think of that's tough like when you get the parameters on it like if if I need to prepare a little. I want to hear. It. I want to hear both. Then what's oh, without God. the parameters? What that's like that's even one? harder because I. It, you can ask Ben. Like every time we do the podcast, uh-huh. we come up with this. Like uh, a, we're like make a I, list. I, I think I think you're. I could probably. I mean, if you had to go Princess Bride, I mean, there well, so I know many. I, one of them was one of the opening quotes on our last podcast, which was. Uh, 
you fell victim to one of the greatest uh, pleasures of all time. The first of which is never get involved in the land, land war in, in Asia. Asia. The second of which is <laughs> never, never engage a Sicilian when death is on the line. Exactly. Um, yeah, the, just the, the land war in Asia, like always, uh, for me, was like one of the funniest lines I'd ever heard in my life. Yeah, that's um, amazing. Yeah, that's probably that I'd, I'd have to pull something from Princess Bride on there. Or anything from a Christmas story, really. Oh, as, you, as you can tell, I've got the leg lamp uh, lit up here, oh, and yes. the other leg lamp. And I over see the there. Princess Bride poster. Oh, of course, both yes. of which movies I have some personal connections, but maybe we'll save those for next time. Yeah, well, oh, yeah, we're, next we're time. definitely having you back for sure. Next right? time, uh, oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah, listeners, listeners, be, be very excited that Braden Tanner has decided to come back and do this once again. Next time on the new way. Yeah. So there was this one time I was totally banging Kelly Kapowski. <laughs> Amazing. As long as I keep all the preparatory, uh, all my stories, I get to keep them for my own. Oh no, 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 we own oh, the sure. the new way owns everything that you I told never, us. I never signed and, off uh, on that, buddy. We're sending everything to, to Neil Patrick Harris because he's like he seems oh, like God. such a nice dude that he's gonna be like. Okay, I'm going to come and do these guys. Just, just so you know, <laughs> we're, we're taking the transcript of this podcast, we're optioning it, and we got Patrick Harris is going to stop. He's going to play Brady Dan. He's going to play Brady Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> On that, we will end the podcast. <laughs> Once again, check us out. That's um, not a bad idea. <laughs> Once again, you he was way us. more convincing than you. I'm sorry. <laughs> and plus, we, we're in South Florida. We needed someone more Jewish. I just want to say. Well, uh, well, once again, uh, you can visit us lastpintprod.com. Of course, you can go on facebook.com slash lastpint. And uh, you can click through from our website. There's all sorts of other social media stuff. But anyways, we want, once again, like to thank Braden Danner. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Braden. man. Uh, there. Uh, really uh, a round of applause. Awesome. Um, yes, this has been The New Way with Ben and Matt. I am Matt. I am Ben. And Neil Patrick Harris will be here next week. <laughs> Cheers. 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 Cheers.